All right, welcome to our panel on Russian-related opportunities at UCLA. I'm Susan Cresson, the UCLA student, uh, uh, Russian flagship student coordinator. I teach third year and also some courses for our graduate students. I'm replacing Allison, who couldn't make it today. You'll also hear from Alyssa, who graduated from the flagship capstone in 2012, and then got a master's degree at Stanford Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, as many of our graduates have. And from James, who, like Allison, came to us as a transfer student. This originated as a program for transfer students and then extended more broadly. Um, I believe uh, James came specifically for Russian. He graduated last year, but has continued to work at UCLA. We'll do a presentation and then open the floor to your questions, which you can write in the chat at any time, but we'll address the questions at the end. In our presentation, we hope to acquaint you uh, with both some general resources and opportunities at UCLA and some specifics about the Russian flagship program here. So first of all, LA is a great place to study Russian, whether at UCLA or SMC or LACC, Pasadena, Northridge, USC. Uh, Russia, uh, LA has the second largest Russian population in the United States, second only to Brighton Beach in New York City. It's especially concentrated in West Hollywood, Zapadly Gliwut, and the San Fernando Valley. So check out the Russian stores and the restaurants, the spas, the bookstores, and immerse yourself in Russian wherever you're studying Russian. Specifically at UCLA, um, the, the department that uh, uh, the home department for Russian language studies is a department of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian languages and cultures. We also, in addition to Slavic languages, we have Hungarian, Romanian, and Kazakh at this point. Uh, our open house will be Wednesday, September 22nd from 1 to 2 p.m. right before the Humanities Convocation. Check the website for any possible updates um, by our very able student affairs officer, Deanna Finlay, who's a wonderful resource for us. We offer three majors, Russian Studies, Russian Language and Literature, and Central European Languages and Cultures, and four minors. Almost all of our flagship students do at least a minor, many double major, since there's so much overlap with the Russian flagship program. Um, these are some of our majors from 2019. It's a very cohesive group. Um, this just this last year, uh, Melissa here and Morgan and Rebecca and Leanna all uh, did alumni-led events for our flagship program. So we love it when our students come back to visit us. Um, as a tip, if you want to major, if you want to double major uh, for efficiency, especially if you have a STEM major, you might want to think about courses that satisfy multiple requirements at once. For example, both GE and Russian major and minor requirements. Um, the courses that have a W also uh, satisfy writing requirements. Among diversity of requirements, uh, courses that satisfy the diversity requirements, Christianities East and West is taught by our flagship director, Professor Vroon, and Slavic 90, uh, Introduction to Slavic Civilization, parallel to the Russian civilization courses, uh, takes four case studies, including Belarus and Ukraine, which are very central to the Russophonic world. In general, we take a broadened view of the Russophonic world uh, in the Russian flag program, including Central Asia. Uh, this year, we uh, next year, we will have our 25th uh, annual undergraduate conference on Slavic, uh, East, Central European, and Eurasian studies. It's a UC-wide collaboration hosted at UCLA based in our department. Uh, as is the undergraduate journal, which is an, an opportunity for you to publish as an undergraduate. Um, and it's uh, UC wide again, but based at UCLA. I believe it's one of three journals like this in the US. Our majors always present at this conference, some juniors, including transfer students in their first year, based on term projects for various courses. So when you're considering topics for term papers, if you have a choice of regions to address, keep this opportunity in mind. If all things are equal, you might want to consider um, choosing something that you could present at this conference. 
It's UC wide, open to all UC students, and we also invite two students from each of the other flagship programs to participate um, each year. Some of our flagship students have also worked as editors in the journal. So I'll turn the floor now to James, who will talk uh, about research and other opportunities. So, hello, my name is James. I'm the Global Data Coordinator at the International Institute at UCLA. And um, besides that, though, I graduated as a history Russian studies double major. I'll be applying to graduate schools this fall and a history PhD program with a focus on Central Asian history is the goal. But in the interim, the International Institute has been a really valuable uh, opportunity, a really good place to work. Um, the Institute focuses on three main things, education, research, and service. So kind of covers everything. There are over 25 centers and programs that operate under the auspices of the Institute. And as you can see, a number of them relate, uh, relate to Russian studies, East European studies, and so on. I mean, we have the Center for European and Russian Studies, but also the Berkel Center for International Relations, there's a program on Central Asia, and then the Promise Armenian Institute, if you want to bring in the Caucasus, if that's a region you're interested in as part of your interest in the department. And so um, if we could realize, I don't have a way to move on, but there we go. The Center for European and Russian Studies has a lot of different resources and opportunities. Uh, they'll have events on a variety of topics related to Eastern Europe and Russia, propaganda uh, in Russia itself, but also Belarusian media, um, even events that kind of cross over talking about Russian and American relations. The list goes on. So a really vibrant events program. And they also have other resources. Um, it, the Center for European and Russian Studies works closely with the department, the Department of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Languages and Cultures. Henceforth, I'm just going to say the department, uh, and in turn serves as connections with the Russian flagship program as well. And one of those connections is providing lists of resources that you can find on SIRS's website. Um, resources that will help you study the region, whether you're interested in research, travel, or both. And so um, in addition to the Center for European and Russian Studies, we also have, as I mentioned, the, uh, the Berkel Center for International Relations. And the Berkel Center offers a lot of resources for anyone who's interested in sort of the political science, the, as it's in its name, international relations, side of things uh, with Russian, East European, Eurasian studies. Uh, and those elements, political science and IR, are certainly very important. They have a lot of events like SIRS. You can see uh, this is another sort of crossover between how do Russian politics impact American life and politics, but there are other events that focus on other aspects of Russia and other regions and countries outside of Russia. Additionally, the Berkel Center's website has a lot of resources uh, that again, focus on the political science part of things. They list academic programs, they list student organizations, they have volunteer opportunities, uh, all of which are related to international relations. And if you're interested in a more immediate foot in the door, uh, the Berkel Center has student internships. So if you'd like to uh, really get your hands in there and maybe see if you can work on Russia, East European, uh, Eurasian related projects, it, it's that opportunity is waiting. Um, and so beyond the Berkel Center, there's also the program on Central Asia. Now the program on Central Asia is called a program rather than a center for a reason. It operates as part of the Asia Pacific Center, actually. And while the Asia Pacific Center usually focuses on Taiwan and uh, surrounding areas, 
Their program on Central Asia really does focus on Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. As you can see, um, you know, the photo I used is from a student source project they had visualizing Central Asia, which uh, took, again, sourced projects from students and displayed many different facets of Central Asian history and culture. So there was one visualization about steppe nomads, but another about modernist architecture in Uzbekistan. Um, so a really interesting, in-depth, careful look at Central Asia. And um, there's other things beyond that one student project. You can see they have a Central Asia workshop. It's primarily graduate students and faculty, but having reached out, I know uh, when I was a student at UCLA, undergraduates are more than welcome. And it's a discussion group, a working group, nothing too formal. So if, you, uh, if they're meeting in these uh, digitally mediated times, which I believe they are, then you'll be able to get a nice, uh, a more informal look into Central Asian scholarship and study. Another thing with regards to resources is they have, uh, there's the Promise Armenian Institute, which uh, has one opportunity in particular that's unique to this center, and that's undergraduate research funding. They have a grant for, I believe, $3,000 uh, for travel and study in Armenia as an undergraduate, as opposed to just graduate students and faculty. Um, but they're a new center, and with that newness, there's a lot of passion. They have, um, they have a lot of events. They have a lot of webinars, everything ranging from folk music presentations to an undergraduate research colloquium. Um, and then beyond events, beyond these learning opportunities, beyond the funding opportunities, there's also a service side of things. So if you're getting into these studies, you know, if you're looking to work for NGOs, doing the more humanitarian side of things, um, they're currently running Operation Armenia, a coordinated effort to provide both immediate relief and long-term aid in support of Armenia uh, following the conflict uh, a little while ago. And so that's the International Institute. Um, and I think those are really the highlights as it relates to entering the department or um, being interested in the area in general. And so beyond the International Institute, I'm also gonna talk about some research opportunities. Uh, I did a fair amount of research as an undergraduate. Um, as I said, a PhD program is my goal, so I wanted to prepare for that as much as possible. And so a few things I'm gonna note are uh, first off the departmental honors programs. I believe every department has a departmental honors program, which is different from Latin honors or college honors. And the chief thing with departmental honors is doing uh, a research project. It's depends on the specific department, but it's a multi-quarter long research project. You have a thesis advisor, um, and it really just helps you get deep into nitty gritty research. I remember my history departmental honors thesis um, without the bibliography was about 55 pages. Uh, they don't have to be that long, but what I mean is it really helps you um, get deep, all things considered, into what you're interested in. With um, the departmental honors programs specifically, they give you a, um, an opportunity in the undergraduate research scholars program, and that gives you uh, potentially thousands of dollars in funding, as well as a wide research resource uh, network. So they'll give you tutors, advisors, uh, connect you to programs that not everyone is in the know about. Um, it's a really valuable opportunity. And so if you're interested in the honors programs, you, it's, you got to apply to the URSP because uh, I, I really found it to be um, an invaluable opportunity. But you don't have to do an honors program. You don't have to do the URSP. You don't have to commit to a multi-quarter project to do research and do good research. Uh, there are independent research courses. You can either take an SRP, Student Research Project 99, or a 199. Both 
count as research, it's just upper division and lower division. Uh, and the research you do there, even though it's just a one quarter course, does count as research. I did a um, research project on Kazakhstani nationalism as a History 199, and I was able to present it at an undergraduate history conference. Because of the subject matter, it was able to count toward my Russian studies major uh, unit requirements as well. And so, as I said, if you don't want to commit to uh, dozens and dozens of pages over three quarters, totally understandable, and there's still research opportunities uh, with that. Additionally, with the department specifically, um, as Dr. Kresen said, we have three majors, and so whichever one of the majors you're taking, you're required to take a capstone course, Slavic uh, 191T, and it's a three quarter long course. No, you don't have to write as many pages as you would for a departmental honors program. Um, but in the course of writing it over those three quarters, it's a really terrific experience. It'll teach you how to conduct research, how to write out research, and how to edit that research. And um, additionally, as Dr. Crescent said about the undergraduate conference, you automatically send in your final draft of the capstone seminar uh, to be considered for the journal. And in being considered for the journal, there's also a corresponding um, undergraduate conference. And so for myself, in taking the capstone course, I finished my paper, submitted it to the journal, um, and presented it at a conference. So not that everything should just be about how your CV looks, but I have a conference presentation and a journal article publication due just to this required capstone series. So that alone um, was a huge, hugely uh, uh, valuable opportunity related to research. Outside of this, there are some other things I can touch on. The, um, there's a institution in the uh, history department called the Luskin Center for History and Policy. There are other research centers. Um, with my work at the LCHP, um, they tend to focus on local policy, but there was one project on um, trends of anti-Semitism around the world. And because of that global focus, I told the director of the center, you know, my personal interests. And so I took point on the section of the report that dealt with anti-Semitism in Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. And so it's not a guarantee that whatever projects are working on will relate to your area of interest, but it's also possible. And so, you know, it would not hurt to uh, reach out to the director, Professor David Myers in the history department and ask if there are any opportunities um, you could sort of, uh, any opportunities you could take up as it relates to your area of interest. And then lastly, um, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to Dr. Kresen, who's going to talk a little bit about research opportunities in the flagship program. Thank you very much, James. James was extraordinary at tapping so many opportunities during his two years at UCLA. I'm actually going to postpone that a little bit and have Alyssa talk about that when she talks about the capstone year. So um, in just a moment, just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Many of our students um, have done research at internships through the CAP program, the Center for American Politics and Public Policy in Washington, DC. It's a great way to make some connections in DC and have an internship. It's offered every quarter. So that may be a long-term uh, thing for you to keep in mind if you're entering as a freshman, but it is offered every quarter. Um, you should have a research project in mind um, when you apply. Um, and a good starting point for research in general uh, in the region is the UCLA guide to, uh, created by our Slavic librarian. We're very, very lucky to have a dedicated Slavic librarian and also curator. She's created a number of exhibits. 
Be sure to sign up for the UCLA VPN proxy server or your local library or community college VPN for access to library resources. These re this access has been expanded quite a lot over the last year and a half. Uh, the VPN will also give you access to Canopy, which is a great source for many free films from the Slavic, East European, and Eurasian world, and others, of course. Just last weekend, I was watching Dear Comrades, uh, which uh, I believe was the 2020 Oscar nominee from Russia, and it's available to you free of charge through Canopy. Another source for Russian films is Masfilm. It has a YouTube channel that you might want to look at. Um, many of them, especially their comedies, I think, have subtitles in English and or Russian. Um, Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu also have Russian language movies and television. Find something that interests you, whether it's a travel show or a cooking show, a sitcom. See how much you can understand, even if you're just a beginning student. Um, see, if, see if you can catch the gist of it. If nothing else, it will help your pronunciation. And there are all kinds of cultural things that you can pick up by watching uh, films and shows. And you'll understand more and more gradually as you continue. So uh, the Russian flagship, turning to the Russian flagship, what is the Russian flagship? The Russian flagship is a language program designed to enable undergraduate students to reach a professional level of fluency in Russian. Any major can combine with it. We have majors in political science, economics, global studies, international development studies, psychology, linguistics, also STEM majors, bioengineering, neuroscience, um, I believe we have a biology major here, Daniela, a math major, Lily. Um, any major can combine this um, flagship, and, and that's an important aspect of it. Um, the flagship program at UCLA, or any of the eight programs, combines study on campus with overseas study, and uh, it highlights the fact that Russian is a strategic language that is targeted by the Department of State and Department of Defense for special funding. Um, there are now eight Russian flagship programs. That number has doubled over the last five years. Uh, when we started, I believe there were four. Um, so it's a high priority program. There is a special Russian language section for the critical language scholarship. Warren Scholarship, Gilman Scholarship. So it's targeted for special funding um, at the national level. It's one of six official lang uh, world languages used by the United Nations. It's important not only for international relations, national security, but also science, business, and so on. And it's spoken by 300 million people worldwide, not only in Russia, but also in what they call their near abroad and the Russian diaspora. Um, so I'll turn the floor to um, Alyssa now, who will talk about the program as someone who went through the entire program. Yes. Um, hello. I don't know how to pin my video or um, if you guys can see me, but um, so my name is Alyssa Harley. I was one of the first to complete the flagship program at UCLA. Um, I was a transfer student and uh, my primary major was political science. I had an interest in political and economic development uh, internationally. It's still part of what I do in my work now. Um, and while I was at UCLA, there was a lot of different ways that I can immerse myself. Uh, being in Los Angeles, there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, when I was at UCLA, there was a Russian club. I was, uh, I'm not ethnically Russian, Many of the those in this group are ethnically Russian or, or Russian speaking. Um, so I was one of the few who were learning it, but I believe now many, many people in the club are, are learning it. it. It gave me an opportunity to socialize in Russian, to kind of make it feel more familiar. And it, it helped when I was studying abroad because I didn't feel as much of a culture shock when I traveled. Uh, I had uh, access to tutors. Um, they, it was really great. I could focus on the international development aspect that I wanted to work on while also developing my listening, reading, writing, uh, grammar, all the other different skill sets. It was just in 
the particular area that I also had a research interest. Um, I know that they were talking about the research opportunities, the sort of capstone part of it. I actually did a research project for the Slavic undergraduate conference every year that I was in the, the program. So that was three years for me. Um, and it was really great to be able to practice using my research skills. The first year, of course, the Russian aspect of my research was largely economics, which is uh, very, the words are very similar in English and in Russian. Uh, and I, I would look at short little articles and, and maps. So it was, you know, as, as much as I was able to at that point, the department let, let me and also guided me in, in starting to do research in Russian. And each year it just built upon itself. I got to present three different times and I was published one of them. Uh, so it was a really great way to both combine the other major that I had, the research interests that I had, and to be able to do it in Russian. Um, many people in international relations field do study an additional language, but there are some that don't, and it actually prevents them from having access to the world through another lens. And I, I think it really helps that I can research additionally in Russian as well as in English. Um, for the academic classes, many of my classes were within the history department, within political science, but also throughout the Russian department. There were different opportunities that were not just language. I was able to take cultural classes. I was able to take writing and literature classes entirely in Russian uh, at a certain point. We had business Russian when I was there. So the department really it gives you a, a different ways to study the language and you don't have to just take Russian either. There's other language opportunities. Um, I believe Ukrainian was starting when I was there. They also have Polish. And if there is, if you don't have the opportunity to take a class with a professor, but you want access to their expertise to be able to ask them, I would regularly have a research interest. I would go up to a professor in a different program and they were more than happy to, to answer my questions and give me some guidance. I had some courses in international economics that I used Russian for. I was actually able to study and research stuff for that class that other students didn't have access to. Um, for my capstone year, that started sort of at the end of my program, but because I did research every single year, I could kind of uh, you know figure out what I wanted to focus on for my capstone, uh, for my capstone research project. You might start researching something and realize you might want to go in a different direction. So being able to um, do it in different ways was helpful. The summer courses were really helpful in being able to ramp up my language knowledge. I did uh, both, a, I did second year during my first summer, and then I did a uh, the Northridge program my second summer and then I did um, another study abroad program my third summer before my final capstone year in which was in Russia at that point um, and you know I, I think that it provided there were so many different ways to immerse myself and there are a lot more ways for students to do that now um, it's a really helpful job skill to be able to immerse yourself into an industry, into a lexicon, into uh, a certain jargon. And uh, the more that you're able to do that, it kind of sets you apart from other students. So it could be helpful if this is your primary major and your primary focus, it could be really helpful as well if it's your secondary one. And during the summer study abroad programs, uh, I did have some friends in other language programs that didn't there weren't, wasn't as much support available as there was through the Russian program. There were always opportunities for scholarships for the study abroad programs during the summers. And, um, you know, at some point I needed a second tutor and I was provided two tutors. Um, so it really helped me be able to get to a very high level of Russian. And during my capstone year abroad, I was one of the first non-native uh, students to get to a near native level fluency. So um, all of these things together can really help, uh, you know, push your language abilities to a very high level. 
which is helpful if you're going to use Russian. It's also helpful for you to just have access to other resources that are not in English. Um, I'm happy, you know, if anyone has any questions about how my experience was, how I use those skills and knowledge now, I'm happy to, to answer anything. I'm, I also, I did the Stanford program and actually I learned more about the program because a different flagship student from a different program went there before me. And they curate a jobs list in uh, Eastern European and Central Asian uh, Slavic Eastern, you know, the whole, the whole area. And I send that to the Russian department. And uh, I, I sometimes it's every week, sometimes it's, you know, sporadic, but uh, whatever opportunities I learn about, I always let the department know. I, I know that it's really helpful to know how you can use the skills and um, research that you have. Um, and I, I know that when I was at Stanford, there was the opportunity to um, intern with the archives in the library. So I'm not sure if with the new curator in the library that's a possibility, but um, being able to handle materials in different languages, even if I wasn't studying them, just that exposure was really helpful. So if you're focusing on Russian, I would encourage you to explore the other languages that are possible uh, as well. Um, and then there are a lot of podcasts out there that you can uh, listen to in Russian. Some of them have transcripts. And so I find that very helpful. And it's not just being able to listen to how one person speaks Russian. It's really helpful to be able to hear how multiple people speak Russian and people of different genders and, region, uh, and regions of Russia. If, uh, if you only learn how Moscow speaks, you, you might miss a lot of interesting opportunities in a lot of us talk, for example. Uh, is there any other pieces there? I would say you can take any course and add a Russian research, research component to it. I actually, in my master's program, had a mechanical engineering course that I did a final project in Russian on. So you can most certainly blend anything together. I think the, there are other programs at UCLA where you can combine stuff together. I did economics with political science. I know that there's computer science with humanities in the, in the digital humanities program. And you know you could always be that first connection too if it doesn't yet exist. But um, the other aspect that I did was start up UCLA. And that was a really great way if you have an interest in business. Um, yeah, and uh, if there, is there anything else that I missed? I don't think so. Maybe we'll have questions um, at the end. Keep, your, keep in mind your questions and write them in the chat, please, and we'll, we'll address them. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. So moving on, the typical course of study, just so that uh, those of you who are going to be at your study know what to expect. When you enter as a freshman, the typical uh, course of study would be four years at UCLA and then the capstone year abroad, or um, it can be accelerated. And many of our students do this. I see Christine is among those who did that. Uh, he's here, many of them did that. Uh, first year Russian and then summer intensive. Typically we can provide funding for that from flagship, a tuition waiver, then third and fourth year Russian, and then the capstone year abroad. So if you start as a freshman, it's possible to do five years worth of Russian getting you to superior professional level within uh, four years as an undergraduate. Some do four years, some do five, depending on what works out best for them. Not all students do the capstone year, that's the goal, and that's what gets you to a superior level, a fully professional level. But um, flagship offers opportunities and the life, uh, life offers opportunities and uh, we work with each student individually to try and figure out what works best for you, the best fit for you. Uh, entering as a sophomore or a junior, beginning to study Russian, uh, in that case you should plan to uh, spend summer of 2022 or the, the summer after your first year at UCLA 
taking for a second year Russian. And again, that's often with flagship funding. Then third and fourth year, and then the capstone year, if you can fit in the capstone year. Heritage students may come in with a high level of Russian, uh, heritage speakers of Russian, and they can fast track. Often we have students taking a special uh, series of courses designed to tap heritage students' uh, listening skills and cultural skills. And after one year of Russian with this highly focused course, they can go into fourth year Russian. So they can do the preparation for the capstone in only two years. Um, that's pretty special, but um, that, that is a possibility for heritage speakers of Russian. Uh, so some of the advantages of weekly tutoring sessions, uh, small group at first and then individual later. We give a lot of attention um, to our students. Um, our flagship ambassadors are involved in preparing all kinds of fun activities and events that are especially for flagship students. The opportunities to study in a Russian speaking country um, with uh, the support that our federal grant enables us to offer. And we really focus on a functional knowledge, on functional knowledge of Russian. We want to be sure that you can use your Russian and that it either practical applications to what you do. And that's an absolutely critical part of the capstone too, where you uh, have an internship. They're expanding the internship hours actually this in this grant cycle from 100 hours to 200 hours. So that's a really top priority that internship is. And the internships uh, match students by uh, their majors or by individual interests. Um, uh, financial support, um, we're federally funded under the language flagship program. So there's funding available to help you pay for uh, summer language intensive courses second year, uh, Russian 20 at UCLA, and uh, some courses um, some, with summer study abroad, and support for the year-long uh, capstone year with the internship. If you're an ROTC student, there can be additional funding. Even if you're not in flagship, ROTC students get a special stipend um, for studying Russian at any level. Um, some, some things that our uh, graduates have gone on to do, um, a lot of our students go on to uh, get most typically an MA in graduate school at a wide variety. Uh, we have a student starting, John Hopkins just started, excuse me, started um, a public health security program this year that one of our students is going into. She's the one who did the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, uh, and she is uh, did the capstone year and she's combining Russian and uh, public health policy in the specialized new program at Johns Hopkins. Um, job placements, many of our students go to work in various uh, departments of the government. Um, but it also prepares you for nonprofits, think tanks, um, uh, various internationally based work. Um, so, in some, what, what do we aim to do? We aim to help you reach fluency, um, uh, bilingual and bicultural, not only speaking at a very high level, but also how to relate to the culture. Um, and many materials are being developed, they're ongoing. Um, for the so-called flagship culture initiative is an extremely important aspect of it. It's an, also an extremely important aspect that you can combine Russian with any major. It's not a standalone. It, it enables you to stand out in your major while using Russian. And the goal from a diplomatic point of view is to create a cohort of professionals who can speak and function in a profession, professional in a Russian speaking environment to enable you to get a superior level of Russian so that you can work with Russian speaking colleagues professionally. We are one of eight programs in the country and I want to make sure that uh, you all have the opportunity, those of you who uh, aren't at UCLA or joining us in the fall that you have this opportunity to find out about all of the programs uh, at an open house September 14th, 2021. Um, it, you'll see uh, videos from a couple of our current students actually at this open house. Um, and here are the um, 
seven other universities. As I mentioned before, there used to be four, and in the last five years, it's been doubled to eight, which reflects the critical importance of Russian in today's world. Um, these are all links. If you're interested in getting the PowerPoint, uh, drop me a line in the chat. Um, if you registered for this, then I have your email and I'll just send it to you. So I'll end with the, oh yes, a couple of upcoming events. Um, our open house, which I mentioned before, um, just to be sure, check online to make sure that it's in person. Who knows what's going to happen over the next month, but we are hoping to have it in our home department. Um, our next event is going to be by Zoom. It's before students come back to campus, and that's on the capstone year and scholarships, uh, yeah, an information session, especially for uh, students going into third year and above, but um, you can always come earlier and find out what opportunities will be available down the line. Um, so, uh, for more information, uh, check our website. You can do a search for UCLA Russian flagship or send us an email. Um, I'm the one that answers this email and I try to answer within a couple of days. So any questions you might have that uh, don't hesitate to write. And for now, uh, write them in the chat. <laughs>